out, you've already received this information. Um, we are going to be changing the church email addresses uh, beginning September 1st. So uh, be watching for those changes and we'll have it up on the screen with the announcements in the next few weeks. Uh, but we're going to all Gmail accounts um, and we'll be sharing that information with you. The other thing is, is that the church now has an Instagram account. So if you are on Instagram, please feel free to uh, uh, follow us and we'll be putting information on Instagram as well as our Facebook page as we continue to try to make sure we're sharing all the information about the goings-ons of the church um, through all different uh, social media platforms that we can. The other thing is, is that we continue to collect um, undergarments, undies for our school-aged children and our community. And uh, next Sunday is the last Sunday for us to be able to collect those things. So uh, as our undies Sundays uh, continue in the month of August, keep in mind that next Sunday would be the last day to bring those items in or to send in a collection for that. We're still needing folks to make face masks to be able to give out to individuals who need them for school, employment, uh, community events, things of that nature. So if you are a person who enjoys sewing, please let Pat Shoemate know or call us at the church office. We'd love to have any additional help that we can have. The other thing is, is all youth that are listening and in attendance, September 13th, we will begin having youth Sunday school class again at 9 o'clock. And we'll begin having youth uh, evening fellowship at 5 o'clock here at the church. Bring your masks, social distancing, all that good stuff that we're continuing to do in in-person gatherings here at the church. But just know that we are getting things rolling again and we are excited to have everyone who is interested in attending those things. That would be all of the announcements that I have for this morning. Everybody take a breath. Gently let it out. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Lead us in truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you are the way to all your Please be seated. Morning prayers. I invite them uh, to be part of what we are about today um, because our prayer life guides who we are. With me on that? Our prayer life guides who we are as individuals and as a church. And, and I'd also like to tell you about something that I'm pretty excited about. We are going to have a prayer caravan. Everybody go like that. We're having a prayer caravan. We're going to meet at 3 o'clock in the parking lot over by the office door. And uh, we're going to stay in our cars. And we're going to, I'll, I'll tell you the route or the route, depending on where you're from, uh, when we get here. But we're going to go and be in uh, a location to all the different churches. Churches, well, probably that'd be a good idea too. Uh, but schools, we're going to do the schools today uh, because school starts tomorrow. Everybody go, okay, right? And I think there's going to need to be some sweet prayers said in those places. So that's our game plan. So if you'd be here at 3 o'clock and like to be here instead, know you're going to stay in your car, uh, we'll figure it out. I've never done one like this before, but I'm pretty excited. Anybody else? Good, good. I see some heads going up and down. So uh, let's begin our time in prayer. And I want to share uh, two prayers with you that have so touched me this week. I've been praying them this week. And uh, so I invite you to join me in these prayers. Oh God, the giver of life, we pray for the church throughout the world. Sanctify its life. Renew its worship. Empower its witness. Restore its unity. Remove from all your people, from all people, all pride and every prejudice that dulls their will for unity. Strengthen the work of all those who strive to seek that common obedience that will bind us together. Heal the divisions which separate your children one from another that they may keep the unity and the spirit and the bond of peace. Oh God, as we begin this new school year, you, Almighty God, we ask to watch over and protect all the decisions being made. And we offer thanks and praise for the gift of new beginnings and for the opportunity to learn and to wonder. And we pray for all the teachers, students, and staff that this year might be rewarding revealing, restoring for all. Be with us as we face challenges, new tasks, the possible fear of failure, the expectation of parents, friends, and self, in our learning and our teaching, that we may grow in service to others and in love for your world. Holy God, you know that we have been talking a lot this week I have lifted up to you that I pray that hearts can be softened. Scriptures tell us that a hardened heart, a hardened heart will not be open to you. So God, we pray that hearts will be softened, that your Holy Spirit might enter in and guide all the many things, God, that it would help us to be who you want us to be as we reach out to those who are so afraid. God, because we know that so much of this behavior, this just kind of sort of attitudes, God, has to do with people being so afraid. Remind us, God, not to be arrogant in our confidence in you. Sometimes we get a little arrogant because we know you and we love you. Remind us that that could be a bit of a hardened heart as well. Soften our hearts. Help us to reach out to those who are in trouble and in need. Fill our hearts. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. David is going to help me do something, and I pray that it will uh, touch your hearts. It seems to be my theme this week. A lot of heart work. A lot of heart work. And uh, so what we're going to do is you're going to hear Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12, and David is going to have a musical response. So what I'm going to ask you to do is really, you might even close your eyes, because I want you to hear this. I want you to hear it and come get immersed in this piece of scripture. Are you with me? that 
existed throughout their Jewish tradition, then the deal was Jesus wasn't actually the Messiah. Now, I want you to hear that because this is part of their tradition, the Jewish tradition. And if early Christians couldn't link Jesus to that long lineage of ancestors, then the idea that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah was not going to work. The Jews had prayed for and believed in this Messiah for centuries, so they had to prove it. Now Jesus, the Messiah, being the ancestor of King David, that's a pivotal piece of information that legitimizes Christianity. It's the first important point that we need to know. The second important point you need to know is that Jesus, whom we worship, pray to, and believe in, and believe that was divine, was the ancestor of King David. Does that sound like I'm saying the same thing over again? Kind of, but not really, because there's a different point here. We have to believe that God created Jesus as an ancestor of King David, because King David, the guy that wrote this psalm, was asking God to create in him a clean heart, because he had just committed adultery with Bathsheba and plotted to have her husband killed the war so that he could have that woman. That's the truth. David was praying to God to fix his indiscretions. Wait, indiscretion is probably too nice of a word. Let's go with completely idiotic decision making. That sound better? Sin upon sin. Horrible choices. Embarrassingly selfish and illegal abuse of his authority. This is the lineage, the ancestral lineage of Jesus. Therefore, it's the lineage that we come from, that our faith comes from. And we need to tell the truth about it. Let's not avoid it. Let's not try to sugarcoat it. Let's tell the truth and grapple with the truth that a revered man of God, King David, was a liar, an adulterer, a cheat, and a sinner. Plain and simple. Tell the truth. Now, does that sound like something a preacher should be preaching on to tell you the good news? Not really, right? But here's where we go. The truth of the scripture that we need to wrap all of our minds around is to realize that the same that is true for King David is true for you and I. No matter how much a man or a woman tries to reform himself or herself, he can never achieve the newness of life that God wants him to have in Jesus Christ. Although a man or a woman can make lots of changes in their lives, even positive changes, that person remains the same person and often just goes from one kind of problem to another kind of problem to another kind of problem when they try to do it on their own. We can't change our lives the way that God can, church. Do you hear that? Do you hear that in the scripture of Psalm 51? You see, you and I can only scratch the surface of transformation that really needs to happen inside of us. God, however, cuts to the quick of who we are and changes our lives just like that. Here's an example of the truth of what happens when we think we can make any sort of significant change apart from God. One time there was a news broadcaster that was introducing a baseball player many years ago. And the news broadcaster said, he certainly turned his life around. He had this uh, tendency to be depressed and miserable before, but now he's just miserable and depressed. You get the point? We can flip the script, but we can't make things truly change without God at the helm of our transformation. So what do we do in our lives when we find ourselves in the same sorts of predicaments that King David found himself in throughout his life? What can we do when we desire to have a clean heart and a changed life? Well, here's a few ideas of where we can start. First, 
We need to accept that our compassionate God is the only one who can give us new life. God loves us so and has such compassion for us as his creation. He will give us new life if we ask. The Bible teaches that there's only one way to get new life, and we need help from the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. King David understood that very well. He had an affair with a woman and had her husband killed so that he could marry her. He could not escape his sin. It became sin after sin after sin. And when the whole mess became public, well, he threw himself on the mercy of God. In Psalm 51, we have David's personal prayer to God. But this prayer can be our prayer too. In this psalm, we can confess that we're unable to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. And we can confess that only God can make us the kind of people he wants us to be. Amen? David said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, he said. He said, I know my sin is always before me. Now listen to this next sentence. And against you and you only. Have I done what is evil in your sight? Now that may sound strange to you if you think about it, because what about the man that David killed? What about the people that we sin against? Don't they count? Don't we have some moral obligation to realize we've sinned against them? Well, sure. But there's something you've got to remember. When we sin against each other, we sin against God. When we gossip, when we spit out angry words, when we insult or hurt people or tell untruths in any way, we not only sin against that person, we sin against God. So we aren't just hurting the person. We're hurting our relationship with God. Why do I say this? Well, I want you to try and experiment the next time that you go to visit someone in their home. When you get there, I want you to start moving around the furniture when it, where it just seems more convenient and more appropriate for you. And then after you've moved around the furniture and you sit down to have your meal, turn to someone in your family and say, that tasted pretty bad. I think I could have done better blindfolded. And then as you leave, walk through the flower bed in front of the house and you know, pull a couple of things that you think looks not too cool there, right? And then see how long it is before you're invited back, right? <laughs> My guess is, is that your host that you were visiting will be offended. Although you never said anything directly to them or directly about them, when you insult the handiwork of a person, we insult the person, right? Likewise, when we sin against each other, we're sinning against God who created each of us, who shed his blood for every single one of us. We are God's handiwork, church. When you sin against another, you sin against God. Moving on. We can all do better to live by the truth that only God can forgive our sin and create a clean heart in us and bring us joy. Amen? We can try and try as we want within ourselves, but there will never be a way for us to create a clean heart and true joy in ourselves the way that God can deliver on this hope. David shows us in this prayer in Psalm 51 how God takes away the sin. He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. You know, in Old Testament times, they used hyssop to sprinkle uh, both blood and water on people to be able to cleanse them from their sin and impurity. And as New Testament Christians, what do we do to be cleansed from our sin and our iniquity? We're baptized. It's this picture of being washed whiter than snow. 
our impurities being washed away, and the blood of Jesus Christ being poured out over us to atone for our sins. And then David continues in the psalm, he says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. What does David mean by saying that these bones you have crushed rejoiced? Here is just a horrible fact of a history. When there was a wandering sheep, shepherds used to break the legs of the sheep so that they couldn't wander. And this meant that the sheep would have to personally rely upon the shepherd and begin to trust the shepherd and follow the shepherd at all times in order to exist. In sorrow, God leads us closer to Jesus. In Jesus, God has hid his face from our sins. God has turned his anger away from us and Jesus took our punishment for our sake. In Jesus, all our iniquities have been blotted out and we can rejoice in that because Jesus has forgiven us. David goes on to say, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast your presence from me or take your Holy Spirit from me. These are the words that tell us how God plans to change us. First, we have to start with God giving us a new heart. You know, sometimes when we talk about the heart of a person, we talk about how the heart of a person is the testament of their entire lives. God gives us a heart transplant when he creates that new life in us through Jesus Christ. And it's a spirit that understands the depth of God's love that's poured out over sinners and that spirit leads us to help us to be able to stand against temptation. Our normal human spirits aren't enough. We give in to temptation. But the new heart and the steadfast spirit that we have within us, that we're given at our baptism, that we're given whenever we receive new life through prayer and praise, that joins us with Jesus. And then God stays with us. We especially pray that God would not take his Holy Spirit from us. If you wonder what would happen if God were to ever take his Holy Spirit from us, here's the truth. We die eternally. God's Spirit gives us eternal life, and without it, we die eternally. Here's the deal, folks. We can't hope to live holy lives unless God is close with us, in spirit, in truth. We can do our part by trying to stay close to God, but seeking out his word as it's preached, as you read it in scripture. We do our part by trying to stay close to God by taking sacraments that Jesus gave us and by living the life that Jesus gave shared with us in the New Testament. We're to imitate Jesus to the best of our abilities. In the New Testament, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He said, Father, make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. He also told the disciples that he was giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit to help them with that truth. Remember that scripture? That brings us comfort in knowing that not only do we have the presence and the Holy Trinity of God wanting to be close to us, but Jesus is promising and giving the Holy Spirit to everyone who believes in his saving and atoning acts on the cross. The Holy Trinity there with us. When the Holy Spirit opens up our hearts and our minds to what God is saying, then we know the truth. Daily, God can restore in us a clean heart through the Holy Spirit of truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we wrap up this time of worship and we wrap up this time of this sermon series that we've been talking about, the truth, I want you to take time to meditate upon this Psalm 51, some this week. 
I want you to be uncomfortable by the words. They should make us a little bit antsy every time we read them throughout our lives. Because these are not words in a scripture to take lightly. We should take none of our scripture lightly, but especially whenever we are praying to God that we want transformation in our lives. That we want to seek the truth. That we want to have clean hearts. It should make us stop for a moment and think, where has my heart been clean lately? And where could it use a good washing? Please pray with me, church. Gracious God, it is with our deepest gratitude that we thank you for loving us, we thank you for seeking us and desiring to create clean hearts in us. Father God, we depend upon you for everything, including the truth. May your Holy Spirit give us greater faith as we hear the good things that Jesus has done for us. Help us to be able to stand up against temptation. Forgive us, God, for thinking that we can live holy lives without any help from you. Forgive us for taking your truth for granted and chasing falsehoods. Forgive us, God, for the times that the very presence and being of who we are, the heart of who we are, running in the opposite direction of you. We truly pray, create in us clean hearts, O oh God. Put a new and right spirit within us. And today we pray this, together as a church, individually in our lives, we pray it for our community, we pray, pray it for our world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Amen. <laughs> 